uh, top of mind is how we can be able to build a truly consumer-centric experience for customers um, moving forward in InsurTech. Uh, so we have an awesome group um, of panelists today talking about um, building the technology product and insurance as one and how to create truly that seamless purchasing experience. So uh, first and foremost, um, we'll just wait a second for everyone to get settled in here. All right, well first and foremost, we have Kate, who is a managing director and investor at Anthemis. Um, Kate was responsible for building the insurance program at Lyft um, to handle all driving programs. And prior to Lyft, she ran um, S the SF office for March. Marsh. Um, Andrea is a VP of marketing at Hippo. Um, Andrea is a national award-winning public relations and marketing leader. And prior to building the marketing team at Hippo, um, Andrea also led the communications at Policy Genius. Um, she comes from a deep background in PR and communications at leading NYC agencies. Uh, ben is co-founder and CFO at Rhino. He remains an active startup and real estate investor. Um, ben is an MIT grad and started his uh, career in structured finance and investment banking at Goldman Sachs. And um, Alex is a CEO and founder of Boost, a digital insurance platform that helps companies offer insurance products through an embedded experience. Uh, prior to Boost, he was VP at IA Capital, where he held uh, board observer roles at Snapsheet and Finance IT. And last but not least, we have Cheryl, who's the senior counsel at Nationwide, where she leads legal and regulatory operations for the Western region. Cheryl has spread her career between top tier firms like Clyde & Co. and in-house roles at Kemper, uh, Genworth, and AIG. And she's, she was also the co-founder of the original InsurTech SF and SV group. So thank you for passing the baton over. <laughs> Um, without further ado, let's welcome our last panel for the evening. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, and I'm honored to be on a panel with uh, so much talent. Um, and happy to see that uh, InsurTech SF is alive and well. Uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, it kind of lost the, the momentum and so forth, and my co-founder moved to Wisconsin to work from uh, Northwestern Mutual Life. Um, any, anyway, we, I think we've gotten a really um, solid grounding in what embedded insurance is now, uh, and with, with the prior panel and the TED Talk, uh, and I think it was mentioned that embedded insurance is generally thought of as a, a P and C topic, um, so here we are, uh, you know, the PNC panel, um, and we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive or in into embedded insurance. And um, uh, we have three themes for our talk tonight: uh, building a product that can be an embed an embedded, underwriting for an embedded product, and then you know, are there any downsides uh, for an embedded product? So uh, I'm going to start with Kate. Um, hi. <laughs> you're, you're set down. I'm ready. Okay, great. All right, so set the stage for us, Kate. Um, yeah, you've been an investor in several uh, early embedded plays, uh, I guess what Trove being one of them. Um, uh, why do embedded plays uh, make financial sense to investors? What's what's the value? Yeah, um, so I, 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 at Anthemis, we've been investing under the, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, we've been investing under the embedded finance thesis for a decade. Um, and what that means to us is we look at financial services as the central nervous system of our society. So that has to be um, accessible, it has to be healthy, all of that for society to thrive. And when you think about business models of financial services companies, insurance included, they are legacy business models that have actually not developed with technology and societal changes that we've seen. Insurance is, is one of them. And I think Jane might have mentioned it, someone else might have mentioned it. If you just think about the rekeying of data we do as consumers, underwriters, brokers, I really hope actuaries aren't rekeying data, but they probably are. Um, you just see we really haven't, haven't evolved. So our investments have always been um, really thinking about how does finance become less of a siloed um, 
product that we you concretely get somewhere else. It really should be built in to the products and services that we as consumers use every day. So that's really our embedded finance thesis. And then when people say, well, what is embedded insurance? Or why is embedded insurance a thing? I just say, it just makes sense. It, it's just, we've heard about it already. Um, and and our, my previous panelists have all talked about it. But if I, if I think about why now, like why are we why are we all here if, if I've been advising a company for eight years in embedded finance and we're all here and it's on the panel today, there's a couple of things that are really important. Um, one is we've just seen advancements in product innovation. There are now products for specific use cases, whether it's a delivery driver, a ride share, a new parent. So we've had product innovation in this space to meet customers with what they need. We've seen robust advancement in APIs the ability to connect all this, that's important. We've seen advancements in AI, machine learning, RPA. That's fueling this, and I think it was Jeremiah or someone who mentioned the omni-channel experience. These experiences are there. So while we've been talking about embedded, and we've known it makes sense, we now have the infrastructure, technology, products, and, and consumers who want to be met that way with these products. So that's why this is really such an important time for embedded. It's very exciting, actually. Your, your enthusiasm is catching. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's okay. I'm just happy to be among people who talk insurance. Uh, so, um, uh, Alex, um, how does uh, Boost help facilitate an embedded plays? And if you are an insure tech starting today, what are the technology table stakes to be able to embed insurance in other transactions? Well, I'm glad Kate set me up so well by saying infrastructure, because that's really what Boost <laughs> does. We, we provide infrastructure as a service for really any company that wants to offer digital insurance products to their end users. So um, basically we work with a number of you know, high, high tech insure tech startups, but also um, uh, digital, digital platforms in other adjacent industries that could, should, and want to be monetizing the insurance vertical. That really is embedded insurance, you know, at its core. And you know, backing up, you know, really the, the motivation for for founding Boost was I came from the VC world, and I, I was investing in early stage fintech and insure tech startups. And what I, ident I identified really early on, um, while I was making insure tech investments, was that the barriers to entry were just massively high for any sort of innovation in the insurance industry, even relative to you know, sectors like banking and lending and things like that, right? So um, what we noticed right, right, right out of the gate was that even if you wanted to just incrementally improve the customer experience, it was really difficult to get a carrier um, to delegate that level of authority and control over that customer, right? It's one of those things that's, you know, held sacred in the insurance industry for, for you know, good reason, where as soon as you kind of kick that over the fence to the insurance company, you're entrusting, entrusting them with that, that customer experience, right? So even just the incremental experience on, on CX alone was really difficult to get to market with. God forbid you wanted to actually touch the product though. If you had you know, an opinion on you know, whatever, if, even if it's a known commodity, a homeowner's insurance policy, a renter's insurance policy, um, it was really difficult, if not impossible, to get those changes and modifications made to the insurance policy itself. And then if you wanted to, if you wanted to do something completely new and different, gig economy, on demand, you name it, whatever, insert buzzword here, to ensure that new risk that otherwise had not yet existed, it was, you're looking at 24, 48 months go to market timeline, right? So even those insured, those early insured techs like, like the fellow sitting next to me over here that were able to kind of endure that go to market timeline to create a new product or even a different spin on an existing line of business um, were then kind of rewarded with the, the task of integrating with whatever carrier partner was, was, was able to uh, support them or willing to support them. So you're, you're kind of trying to put Uber on Windows 95 at that, at that, uh, at that point, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't scale at least, right? So uh, we set out to build infrastructure as a service, and that's a really broad term where it's not just an API, and it's not just technology, it's not just policy administration systems. It's all of that, plus the actual compliance, capital, and operational infrastructure that any company needs to get to market in this space, right? So all of our customers are effectively MGAs uh, that are appointed by Boost. Boost is a you know, imagining general agency by, by structure, but we work with a number of um, you know, AMBEST A rated fronting carriers that really delegate carrier level authority to us. So we, in collaboration with our partners, can actually create insurance products from scratch in the analog world and then develop and then actually file them and, and actually manage the program administration of, of all of these products um, in addition to configuring them into a policy administration system so that all of the workflows can be automated 
and, and you can provide that kind of instant digital experience to the end customer. So our partners, whether they're an insure tech startup or you know, you insert the other technology company here, they can actually integrate with our API and then embed that entire experience within their front end environment. So we really provide infrastructure to embed experiences in, in insurance products in other companies' front ends, whether they are focused on insurance as the core business or come from an adjacent industry that want to monetize the vertical. Yeah, I, I, um, it's been like six, seven years since I started engaging with InsureTechs, and, and I think there was a, a very um, hard realization of just how difficult the barriers to entry are to overcome. Yep. And, uh, the, you know, InsureTechs aren't going to push carriers out of the way. Uh, they need the infrastructure that carriers have, but carriers have old infrastructure and they need what InsureTechs can bring. So um, as an insurance regulatory attorney, you know, times 50 states, uh, it's it's a nut, it, it's nutty, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, uh, ben, uh, Rhino uh, has a bit of a different um, area here within the insurance sector, InsureTech sector. It, it requires this buy-in from property managers and landlords who use dozens or maybe even hundreds of different software uh, for their management um, of their properties. How did you determine where to go first and what functionality to build? Yeah, excellent question. I actually want to talk a little bit of, or respond a little bit to what Alex said because I think it's sure. super, super important. Um, luckily, it didn't take us uh, 12 to 24 months to launch, but we were, you know, we're in insure tech from four or five years ago now. And this difficulty of launching a brand new product uh, in a, you know, forging in a carrier partnership, having them trust us to do something brand new, convincing them that we knew how to manage risk, run policies, be compliant, etc. That was all a very much an uphill battle. And Alex has built, has built and is, uh, is in market with, is invaluable to like the next wave of, co of uh, insure tech. Um, if, I'd say if, if he was, a, if your company was up and running when we were starting, we probably would have like uh, partnered with Bruce as well. Whatever's next for you guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but back to the topic at hand. So it, it's actually two dimensional. I, I think about it first as we did build a brand new product. And so the first step that we had was we got to create forms. We have to create pricing. We have to convince a carrier. We have to sign an MGA agreement, et cetera, be appointed. Insurance licensing, the list goes on and on claims and on. Handling. As claims handling as you, and we handle claims internally. So going through all of the rigmarole of building everything really from scratch, even though we're not an insurance carrier ourselves. And step two is really the embedded part. How do you propagate this product by partnering with landlords in order to get the product in front of renters at the point in which they're making decisions about you know, how to rent their apartments, how to put deposits down, or whether to choose an insurance alternative, which is what we do at Rhino. Um, so we knew that upfront. We focused a lot on product initially. But soon after getting product in market and convincing landlords that was a reasonable thing to offer to their renters in lieu of a cash deposit, quick next step was how do we embed this in their workflows? How do we develop technology integrations into the software they're already using? How do we make this as seamless as possible? And it's still an uphill battle because landlording is fragmenting, fragmented. Uh, there's lots of different types of property managers and owners of all different scales using all different types of software or not even using software. And it, you know, we build with some of the top property management companies uh, and software companies. We create manual workflows or semi-automatic workflows. Uh, and really the most critical features that we've built up front is kind of table stakes for us. How do you take uh, a tenant's information who is signing up for a product and automatically invite them to sign up for our product in lieu of the cash deposit. So that's the first feature we built. And then quickly second to that, you know, our clients, our landlord and property management clients wanted us to meet them or we decided we should meet them where they work. And so pushing all of the coverage information, all the critical insurance and information and claims handling uh, or ability to make claims into their systems where they're natively working day in and day out. That's really impressive because in addition to all the insurance laws and regulations, there's all the ten landlord tenant laws Absolutely. and regulations and <laughs> vary from state to state and even city to city. So um, a lot of moving parts there that you had to corral. Switching to um, uh, 
now uh, you've got a product and, and now you want to start underwriting, right, uh, Andrea? Um, Hippo took what uh, we would call more of a clean slate approach in designing its home insurance product um, with modern coverage that the consumer didn't even know they needed, frankly. Uh, I know a little bit enough about, yeah. uh, about Hippo. Um, how did your team develop and iterate on its product and marketing to, to diversify its offering? Yeah, I think in the early days for us, um, we went in with the hypothesis, and not to be a bummer here, but no one likes to shop for insurance. <laughs> so we went in understanding Shopping. that. I know, <laughs> surprise. So um, with that understanding, we wanted to take a lot of the, and, and a lot of folks on the last panel spoke about this, but we wanted to take the burden off the customer. And so what we did is in the early days, we developed a really flexible product um, and the tech stack uh, highly leveraged data integration. And so a lot of what we built in the early days without us knowing had embedded like qualities. And um, we were able to answer questions like how far your house was from a fire hydrant without any inputs from the customer. And uh, that allowed us to launch products like um, a builder product a couple of years ago that is completely underwritten on a brand new home and pre-quoted, which is about as embedded as you get, <laughs> um, without having to develop an entirely new product. And so as we continue to focus on our future around the customer and what the customer needs, both from a coverage standpoint, as well as meeting them where and when they want to buy, um, we're integrating with a variety of different organizations, groups, and partners. And I think a lot of what we, the decisions we made in the early days about how to build the product and how to market the product have played a strong role in our success um, on our distribution strategy as well as our um, consumer impact these days. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, in a different area, uh, Ben, um, there's a huge, variability in the security deposit requirements from state to state or city to city, you know, Des Moines, Iowa versus New York City. Um, how do you complete underwriting quickly with such a variety of potential solutions and what was the biggest challenge in figuring this out? Yes, uh, this is another great question. This is something at least we had our eyes open to when we walked into the, the business that we created. Um, deposit requirements are different everywhere. They're different for different people. Um, and so really what we decided is we're going to create a platform and an ecosystem where property managers and owners can create rules and create, uh, you know, create structure to how, is, how are we going to automate these coverages that are required by tenants who are applying for their apartments. Um, and so we built that up front. Uh, we take in information from our, uh, our, our property management customers. They feed us some information about the tenant and we complement that. With direct um, direct information about you know financial uh, background, uh, employment background, educational background, etc., to really fill out the underwriting, um, and then you know we we give unique quotes <coughs> to each uh, tenant based on all that information. Uh, one of the other things early on that we knew was going to be important because it's a brand new product is creating flexibility for our model somewhere. And so now with operating four years worth of history and four years worth of data. We're able to take that in and really ingest it, create the you know right slices and the right predictability of the outcomes, and really deliver the best in class pricing to our customers as well, which gives us a huge head start for advantage. Uh, Kate, uh, you, you're on the uh, investor side now, but at one time uh, you worked at Lyft, and uh, from an insurer perspective. Uh, not that Lyft is an insurer, but <laughs> <Where are they? laughs> Where are they? very good question. Good topic for later. Um, from an insurer perspective, what are what are some of the challenges with embedded solutions, such as uh, the potential for fraud, adverse selection, and how can underwriters address these concerns yeah. in a digital way? So, um, I think similar to the story Ben told, we had to create insurance for ride sharing. And that was in 2010, 2011, and no insurers um, wanted to, to touch it. And, and if you recall at that time, it was um, a lot of people, a lot of insurers um, thought what we were doing was illegal and in violation of law, so therefore just not even insurable. Um, 
So in many ways, the insurance product within ride sharing that goes on and off at certain times was a very early embedded insurance product, utilizing the data that um, we had as a ride share company, but insurers couldn't even ingest to, to underwrite off of or understand at the time. Um, I think that the, the, some of the challenges were in, in that case, you may know when the insurance is on because somebody's on a ride, but you don't necessarily know when the incident happens. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a little bit of the potential for fraud. I'll use fraud instead of adverse selection because I think the adverse selection is actually better. It is more eliminated in embedded products because to have adverse selection, you have to have a lack of data or some party having more knowledge than another. And I think with embedded solutions, you have a lot more data and a lot of good data. So it's a little bit more of, of managing fraud and just really um, having a very robust claims um, process. And, and I hate to say this, but you have to build these products and these platforms with the idea of if they can be gamed, somebody will figure out how to game them. And you have to really design around that from the very beginning. I want to follow up on the point on uh, adverse selection and how it's actually addressed yeah. Yeah. pretty well with the embedded flow. We, our thesis is usually just summed up in insurance is best sold alongside or behind a complementary product or service, often you know, that's to the benefit of the underwrite. So we, it's, the example now is like cybersecurity, so risk assessment tools and things like that, that then can embed an insurance product right behind or alongside that core software and risk assessment offering, right? I mean, that's, it's something that you know you have a responsible customer that's sitting there with a risk top of mind. They're trying to they're trying to do something about about it to protect themselves. And, and insurance is just an add-on at to, just to add a, at, at checkout, basically. So it's it's that kind of travel insurance model for everything for, from a, for like a purchase experience perspective. But it can be applied um, pretty uh, pretty impactfully in other lines of business that are far more complex. What and just to follow on to that, Alex. Um, uh, the question here is, um, are there times when um, there should be discounts to a prospective policyholder, or are there times when it should cost more, given the really short time you have for customer engage, direct engagement? Everyone wants it to be cheaper. Yeah, everyone wants <laughs> Always. it to be cheaper. Yeah, exactly, Always. yeah. Um, I think there is a argument to be had that you price convenience into certain purchase experiences, right, where the consumer doesn't have to go and spend, you know, an hour shopping around for insurance, right? They, it's really convenient right at the point of sale. It's an embedded in another product that they already have assigned value to. So you can make the argument that it should be more expensive, but you can also make the argument uh, that it should be cheaper, right? Because you have data, auto-populated fields have been a common theme. I've heard a lot of people uh, mention this is verified data um, that's being applied to an insurance application right out of the gate, right? So. Um, you can make an argument both ways. I'm not going to touch that subject or pick a, pick a side. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, touch that. I'll touch that a little bit, though. Um, okay, I do think I think um, consumer expect you can't put consumer expectations aside, particularly as this becomes more ubiquitous and there's exchanging of data um, or in, the insurers are accessing data sets. Consumers are going to want credit for changes they make that improves their risk profile more than waiting necessarily for an annual underwriting. Um, and you wanna use that data throughout the year. Consumers, I think, are also going to want to use their data, so if they do cut all the limbs of all the trees that are might fall on their house, they want a credit for that. Um, so so I think it's something to just keep keep your eye on as what, what consumers will want. Right, it also depends on the, on the partner in front of you, right? the distribution partner right. in front of you, right? Because if they are doing something compelling on the data side, then you should, they, they should be rewarded for that, right? If they're not, and it's just, you know, affinity marketing just on a website, then, then there is no argument for that, right? So yeah. it's about embedding it in every, in every sense of the word and applying the data directly. Well, and, and I, I live firsthand uh, this issue every day just because I'm here in California and there's all of the wildfire mitigation steps and insurers want immediate recognition of that and it hasn't actually been proven that it necessarily 
causation and so anyway, that, that's not the topic for today, but it's, <laughs> it's one that I live every day. Um, so again, now switching to our third theme on uh, downsides of in, embedded uh, insurance. Um, uh, ben, in the traditional agent broker relationship, um, there's a clear understanding of where support is delivered, right? And uh, how can you deliver support to your policyholders at Rhino? Uh, not how can you? How do you? Uh, I'm gonna flip this around and not call it a downside for us. Okay. Well, I, you know, okay. In the traditional sense, uh, agents, you know, agents serve this. The questions. I know, but they, serve, <laughs> they serve their place in the market. Okay. Um, but for us, um, you know, we lean into customer experience and customer service, and so this is really helpful for us because we want to own it all. Um, we are an MGA, but we do service both, you know, we have two sides of our business. We have customers that are property managers and owners of real estate, and we have tenants and renters of, uh, of apartments that they, uh, that they manage. And both of them have lots of different questions because what we're doing is brand new. They need a seamless claims experience. They need success managers to make sure that uh, we're answering questions for property managers about how the renters interact with us, et cetera. And on the renter side, uh, our support flows, we're live 24 seven on phone, email, and chat because guess what? Leasing happens 24 seven sometimes uh, and people are very competitive about the apartments they wanna live in, in San Francisco, New York City, everywhere. Um, and so we need to meet the customer at the time and in the type of manner that they wanna to talk to us. So really we look at this as upside because we get to own the customer experience and it actually, we it is insurance, and it's very clearly insurance. Uh, you know, when you're going through our flows, but we make it feel so seamless that it's really just it's a common sense solution instead of putting down a cash deposit of one thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars, buying an insurance policy five, ten, fifteen dollars a month. It just it's the common sense solution, and so we're there to talk to the customers, answer any questions they have, just because. You, know, you heard the prices I put out there. Like, it's, uh, some people don't understand and ask lots of questions just because it's confusing. Uh, never having interacted with a product like ours, right. always having to do the traditional security deposit. Well, and, and seamless, I think, is the word for the. I mean, my 80 year, old, 80 year old mother wants to be able to have an app or go online. Everybody wants it seamless, they want it to work and you know get their answers immediately. They don't want to have to wait two or three days for somebody to call them back um, and, and answer their question, maybe. So, uh, Alex, what is the uh, typical support model for Boost clients and do they use uh, agents internal to their company or function more as a SaaS business? Yeah, the vast majority of our partners are, are similar to Rhino in the sense that they want to control the servicing piece. They want to own the entire customer experience, right? So one of the reasons we built Boost the way we built it was so that we could delegate that level of control to, to our customers. So. One of the key questions that any company that, that wants to get into this space, whether it's an insure tech or a, an embedded channel partner, is how much control do I have over that 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 part of the business? Everything that happens after the point of sale. I think we're not doing embedded uh, in any justice. We're just talking about the up to everything that happens up to the point of sale. Because everything that happens after that is is equally, if not more, important, you know, to the end customers. So you have great quote find an issue, right? That's pretty well solved, right? About it's everything that happens after it's endorsed, modify your policy, you know, cancel, renew, and then most critically, claims. Right? Can you at least handle the FNOL, the first notice of loss, on on a claim for your customer on behalf of the insurance company, or is that going to be taken uh, taken control of by the carrier that's working behind you? So we build all that flow through the same a single API, so that all of our partners can can handle that that piece of the business as well. And most of them want to. That doesn't mean all of them want to. A lot of a lot of companies come to us and they're just like, I just want to like put a widget on the website. And, and have it available to, to our customers. That's not really what we're looking for in general, because one, you can't just like put insurance on your website and hope people find it, right? It, insurance does have to have a little nudge. It might not have to be sold directly, uh, you know, uh, by brokers and agents, but it does have to be. You have to tell customers that it exists, and then after that, it's they're not going to be repeat cu customers if uh, if you're not really kind of cultivating that relationship and making sure that uh, it's a vertical within your business as opposed to just like a lead gen part of a full fee. Um, you know, source on your website. Yeah. Um, Andrea, the, uh, with an embedded product, is marketing different from a traditional product um, that's offered direct to consumer? Um, is it harder to market it? 
it's definitely very different. And uh, Alex just cued this up well. You can't just put something out there and, and hope the seagulls come, right? So um, you've got to market it, but it's it's vastly different marketing a B2C product versus a business to consumer product versus embedded, which typically is business to business to consumer. But insurance is still a game of trust. So most of my um, experience has been in business to consumer, and that starts very early in the life cycle of a startup or a business holistically. You have to build awareness, trust, understanding, education around that product, and then why you as the company are the best fit for the customer. And on, for Embedded, you also have this extra layer of an audience that's the business partners that you're gonna be working with. So you have to develop a um, multi-pronged marketing strategy and approach and typically start a bit later. Um, I've advised several companies that, uh, that started a little too early and didn't pay enough attention on the embedded side to their sales and product flow. And so if people learn from their sales and their biz dev early on and then build out a B2B marketing strategy that layers into the businesses they're trying to sell into. And then eventually, if they want to pure brand against that so that there's trust within the buy flow or the cycle so that somebody doesn't stop, pause, and say, wait a second, who am I buying insurance from? Um, then flip over to the B2C side, which is typically a lot more expensive and comes with a lot more resources. So even back in um, a former life where I was working in travel, and travel insurance was starting to become embedded. Um, first, people were marketing to us at Travelocity, the company I was with, and then it became a diversified enough um, industry and organization where people had to start looking out at the, the consumer base, and it just became vastly different in terms of the marketing strategies and, and the approach to us. So I do think it's very different, and I think that a lot of people make the mistake on the embedded side of diving in too early and spending a lot of money Marketing. You mean marketing too early? Yep. Yeah. Just diving into that, those strategies really early and trying to get their name out there. Right. When really they need to be focusing on the sales and the biz dev early on. Okay. I agree with that. We have like we have a philosophy. It's like walk, walk, uh, crawl, walk, run with our embedded channel, right? Where some of them are ready to have already tested user engagement. They know that they want to invest heavily um, through some sort of like partner referral, a click through to a carrier's website. And they, they're ready. They've already done all the analysis and, and are ready to invest in, that, in a new vertical within their business. Others haven't, right? And the ones that haven't should really crawl before they walk and, yeah. and definitely before they run. Right. Um, and we, we've seen that you know, play out in, in real time several times. Now. The ones that are already ready to invest in the vertical and have, have done all that kind of test phase and engagement phase are by far more successful partners on, on the embedded side. Oh. Hopefully that's useful information for the audience as well. Um, uh, last, last question before we, we take some questions. Um, this, this one's for you, Kate. Um, uh, as an investor, um, what are some of the tough questions um, Anthemis asks InsurTechs who are looking for funding for their embedded product? And, yeah, Kate, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, what are your thoughts about um, investing in embedded insurance in 2022? Make yeah. the New Year's prediction. No, so we, we've invested um, in embedded offerings, um, both at the early stage through through the later stage. I, I focus on um, Series B and later companies right now. So my um, my questions tend to if I'm if I'm asking a question about marketing, I want Andrea to answer it the way she was talking to us here. Um, so I'm looking for a bit of that maturity and going back to, to what Ben said earlier, when we're talking to an embedded um, company, we are asking the questions of how are you handling claims? Who's advising you on regulatory counsel? Um, how, how are you looking at your loss ratios? Who, who's looking at them? We're getting really kind of technical on the insurance side. Um, and and we, we want to hear, obviously, what problem they're trying to solve and how big the market opportunity is. Um, on this last sales point, I think that, you know, that's, a, that's one where I dig in a lot on, like, who are your customers? And, and Alex and I were joking about this because people were like, this is great about Embedded. Everybody's our customer. I'm like, well, that doesn't always end well. And then how do you, how do you market? 
catering to everybody, but it's that whole idea like, oh, well, there's like a, a consumer that's going to buy the embedded product, there's an insurance partner who's going to work with us to embed a product, and then there's going to be a neobank that's going to put it on their, their website. So it's really just understanding what is the strategy and what is the market opportunity with, with that strategy. I think one of the big watch outs are there is um, embedded offerings have multiple dependencies on the carrier partner as well as the, the partner that you're distributing with. And sometimes those, so there has to be, what you're building has to be scalable and applicable to many of those distribution partners and carrier partners, but you also have to pick the right partners. Because if you, if I've seen too many times um, embedded providers choose a partner that is a great logo, maybe it's a top five auto manufacturer who wants to embed an insurance offering when they sell a van, but if that partner is not ready to really incentivize the, the insurance purchasing, if they don't have you know, dealers on the ground that are, are really ready to do that and an infrastructure to do it, you're gonna really end up developing a product and a relationship that doesn't actually start to generate the insurance premium needed. So I'm really digging in on, on those areas when, I, when I'm talking to a, an embedded offering. I still, I, I am very bullish on the embedded space. Um, and I do think um, we didn't have this as a topic for a full event a year ago. So that's really um, a, a, a where, where that bullishness comes from. So I think we will see more offerings and, and we will see more partners partnering with um, companies like Hippo and, and Boost and Rhino. Perfect, well, thank you. Um, we, we have some time for some questions, and obviously we have a very knowledgeable panel, so here's a, an excellent opportunity to get some of your burning questions answered. Oh, we have one in the back. My name is Sandy, I work on the venture capital side as well. My question is uh, you, Alex, I'd like to understand for a, a very early stage startup, pre-seed seed stage, um, how would they work with you uh, if you know you still don't have traction with this figuring out the product? They might have some uh, users or customers, but they don't have definitely millions of revenue. Uh, sure. How would be the way they would come up with a new product? An insure tech startup or an embedded channel partner? Either? Embedded. Embedded. So we, we have a bottoms up and a top down approach at Boost. That's a, that's how we kind of think about new partnerships. Where we get we get calls all, all the time from from either insure tech startups or other embedded channel partners that have ideas to sell insurance. Right? We have currently nine lines of business at Boost that are live and, and up and running. These are insurance products that are filed, managed by us, and are configured in our systems and available through our API. So if it is one of those, then all they have to do is just pick their product configuration, more or less, via the API and integrate their front end software into that. That can take as little as two weeks, depending on the line of business. If they have really strong opinions on a product and want to want to actually add an endorsement or a coverage or what have you, then that takes some work. Out. Obviously, as anybody in the insurance industry knows, right? So we we will go through that process if it if it seems like a good idea and a good concept, and we will add that coverage to the policy. It, it, that would take anywhere between you know one and six months, depending on how crazy we want to get here, right? You have to file the product, you have to get it approved by the regulators. There's some immovable objects in this industry that that we can't do anything about, right? Um, if it is a brand new line of business, though, completely new and and, and uh, and unscripted here, and we've gone, we've done some crazy things too, some very weird products, and more to come. Um, I'll give you an example: is a parental leave insurance policy for employers, right? So it's a it's a private solution to kind of supplement all the public benefits that are out there um, and the state funds that are available to employers, so that they can offer parental leave benefits to their workforce, right? This is a modern table stakes benefit in this day and age. Um, so a founder came to us, and he had come from a completely different industry. He was a CFO of a mid market consumer goods company. He just knew the problem, and he had, he had an idea for a solution, and he thought insurance might, might be helpful for something like that. So our team loved the concept. We, it's a new market, but we really believed in the market opportunity, and still do. And we just worked with him for a period of six months, it, roughly it took to actually develop a brand new insurance product that didn't otherwise exist in the market, and, and get it live in, a, in the API so uh, he and his co-founders could go and sell the product in, in the market. So it really varies a lot, and I hate to, to kind of punt him to say it depends, but it really does. Um, new products anywhere between six 
months and 18 million years if it's personal auto or home <laughs> insurance. Um, but you know, anywhere in between. We, we, we move fast, that's one of the key value props that we like to offer the market. Yep. Yes. Um, my question is, when you're designed, like if you're introducing a completely new form of insurance that has never existed on the market, how the heck do you set premiums? And what happens if you launch and the, the premium you calculated is totally wrong? Like, is there, like, do you have insurance on your launch? Like, how does that work? So, Who wants to take that? You take it first. You actually take it first. Right? <laughs> you don't want to hear the regulatory Are you going to make me answer? do math before I answer this? I was told there would be no math, so I'll try to try to find out. Um, our approach was. You know, so what it, it's fundamentally what we're doing is deposit insurance. What are deposits used for? It's when p uh, tenants don't pay their rent or they cause excessive damages to their units. The biggest correlation with that is credit, credit worthiness, consumer credit. That is actually a deep, deep market. It's not an insurance, it's in finance, which mm -hmm. happens to be part of my background. Uh, so we really looked at what we could do uh, from the finance side to understand consumer consumer dynamics and consumer credit dynamics and how we could build our first underwriting model using that. That was one component. The second component is we're, we didn't actually, there's, there is data that represents the risk that we are bearing, but it's just insanely hard to cobble together because you're talking about one, going to property managers and landlords who do not structure data in any way. Two, you're having to join upfront underwriting criteria for those residents with the back end accounting information about deposit withholdings, which happen at very different moments in time, and try to join them together. So we did a little bit of that. It was a lot like rolling up our sleeves or trying to go to best in class uh, property managers to see what we could put together, but really using that to triangulate it. And then, you know, set it a little bit higher to be conservative. Uh, so we don't lose our shirt up front uh, because initial customers sometimes are the adverse customers. Um, but that's that's kind of the mentality that we took, the approach that we took. Again, this is four or five years ago, so we're in a totally different echelon now in terms of all the data we have. Hundreds, almost millions of data points that we use to calibrate now, but that's so it was like a, like a best guess based on whatever data you could cobble together. Yeah, and that's, you know, it goes back to, I think the first thing that uh, I, I touched on that Alex brought up first is the leap of faith that insurance carriers have to take to work with people like us um, is crazy. And doing it now is easier because Alex is here. Uh, doing it five years ago, very hard. Lots of people made full stack carriers. The original insure tech goers, a lot of full stack carriers still around. Um, so yeah, it's 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 difficult. Uh, what do you say? say? <laughs> no, but in, in all seriousness, uh, not with parental leave. We're not we're totally a one trick pony there. So there's one I really would love to tell you about right now, but we're announcing it in January. But there's another one that's a known commodity, but we took a different spin on it, and it required buying a brand new rating factor for it in the admitted markets. More often than not, when we do a brand new, never existed before line of business, we do surplus lines first, freedom of form, allows us to iterate really, really fast, right? So the parental leave product for that is true. We've already iterated on that like. Fifth times it's been live for like six months basically but um, we do we did a startup management liability product one that was focused on venture back startups there's a lot of other companies out there that are doing similar uh, similar spins on that same uh, kind of angle here but we actually developed a, a product that we think is, is differentiated in the sense that it has a it has a filed rating factor that is completely unique that directly impacts the price of the insurance based on who their venture backers are based on actual quantitative uh, analysis of that venture backer's performance over the course of 15 years. So I just leveraged my own experience. But I, know, I was a VC. I knew this data existed because our own LPs would would report it. So that was what held us accountable. We can have as many TechCrunch articles as you want, positive ones. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it matters how much investment return you're providing to your limited partners. It's the pension funds, it's the insurance companies that invest in those vehicles. Not all the ones that have the household name brands do very well, right? So. What we did was we pulled 15 years worth of that data at a fund level, and we, we have that data scientists and actuaries that work in, internally at, at Boost, so they know what they're doing. I'm never gonna even attempt to try to describe it, um, but they're, they're smart and they know what they're doing. And we built a data model that actually could, in our, in our opinion, predict the probability of success or failure of a startup based on the historical probability of success or failure of the portfolio companies that had, of the venture backer that had invested. Then we came to California, and we met with the CDI, explain this to them before we even filed, 
make sure that they felt comfortable with it. And then they got very excited about it, actually supported it, and we filed it confidentially, but it's the only you know, unique grading factor out of there. So that's about six months to develop a really, a, a truly data-driven model to impact the price of insurance so that, that startups aren't paying more for DNO you know, than like a utility company just because they're small and nobody really knows if they you know, are gonna be successful or, or fail. You know, so we really try to address that subjective um, you know, downside for the underwriter by actually doing the modeling and, and actually creating a pricing to, to make the argument that this should be actually credited, not, not uh, more expensive for the, uh, for the, end, for the end policy holder. Right? So that's just an example of one thing that we've done. And I, I know we're over time a little bit, but I will say that meeting with the insurance departments is really key. Yeah. And even I work for Nationwide, been around a long time. We have pre-filing meetings with them um, just to hear any uh, concerns they might have. I, I think just at the most fundamental level, the question is, is how do you even know which line of insurance it falls under? You know, yeah. and that's that's really where you have to start. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think we're out of time. I, I would wanted to offer. Uh, the other two panelists, and final word, if you have any words of wisdom to... No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we get to go have some more pizza. Um, yeah, yeah, I know yeah, we're in thanks, the network. Thank you for your, yeah. your questions. It was really yeah. fun to get the creating an insurance product and add first development question and not be still at lift. <laughs> <laughs> but are they still an insurance company? <laughs> <laughs> are they ever an insurance company? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you all. This is uh, this has been a lot of fun.